Would you consider yourself to be a music fan? Yeah, I definitely would. I've been a music fan since... I think it started when I was about 11, which would have been, well, I, was seven, I was 13 in 1977, so kind of go back a few years from there. My cousin, John, was a year older than me, and he was into Mud, and I was into Sweet, and we both thought our favourite band was the best band of the two, but we both loved both of them secretly but we thought our band was better than the other one. He did admit to me in later years that I was right. So that was in 1973, 72, 73. I loved the suite, I loved Susie Quattro, and I loved a lot of Slade and T-Rex and bits of Bowie and all that kind of glam stuff. And then when I was 13 in 1977, Again, my cousin John actually introduced me to John Peel on the radio and I listened to John Peel every night, five days a week for probably a decade like many other people did and uh, the punk thing completely changed my life and that kind of morphed into the post-punk thing like sort of bunny men, cure, banshee stuff and that kind of went into goth and new romantic and then it all went a bit shit in the middle of the 80s and then the acid house thing happened in the 80s and I've been lucky really that I've been in the right place at the right time a few times and uh, absolutely I've been in love with music all my life so it's been the first love of my life better than girls so what does being a music fan mean to you well I I kind of got to a point where 1977 was a turning point for me. Blondie played Lancaster University. And I remember saying to all my friends, Blondie, I play in Lancaster University. None of them had heard of Blondie. Weren't remotely interested in going to this gig, which, you know, was 10 miles away and two bus journey, two buses in each direction. Well, we were only lads, really. I was 13. And I remember just thinking, right, well, I'm never missing another gig waiting for my friends. If anybody else plays that I'm bothered about, that's their problem. If they don't want to go, they're the ones who are missing out. <clears throat> and the next band that played that I really loved were the adverts, punk band. And I went on my own, which involved two buses and turning up at Lancaster University, where I'd never been before, in the middle of nowhere, standing in this queue of people who were all into the punk thing kind of got you know I was a little bit I wasn't late in the day but some people were there first so everybody was like dressed up in all the punk thing and I turned up in flares which was the, you know the ultimate sin of a punk uh, attire so I actually ended up tucking my trousers into my socks to kind of try and disguise the flares thinking oh no I'm a bit late on this one but then I came back and I was so proud of myself that I'd been Really, that was it from then onwards. Any time I loved a band, having no money, no friends that wanted to go, any of that made no difference to me anymore. I would hitchhike there if I had to. I'd get in, even if I didn't have a ticket. I'd find a way of getting in. It just it wasn't available not to go. I loved it too much. And I think that's what being a fan meant for me. It was like, there's very few things in life that will make you get out of bed on a rainy day with no money, not really feeling like it, and get up and do something like hitch across the country to get somewhere the first thing that you haven't even got a ticket for. That's like, you only do that if you really fancy somebody or it's a band that you love. I can't think of anything else that I'd do that for, or a combination of those two, obviously. So who would you say is your like, ultimate favourite band or <coughs> <coughs> well, The Sweets are my favourite band of all time, which is um, is such a sort of time, date, out of date thing now in a way. I can't imagine anybody coming to that conclusion now based on a back catalogue. Well, in the same way that you <coughs> became a, a One Direction fan at a particular stage in your life and then it kind of stays with you. I think that's probably true for most people on some level that you have a 
I mean, a lot of theorists talk about the sort of golden age thing. You have a golden age of when you're at the right time in the right place, maybe with the right mates, or you found the right mates to enjoy something that you all just thought was brilliant. And then some people might say, not me, that that's similar to your first sexual experience or drugs experience where you kind of endlessly chase this thing that is probably never going to happen again but you kind of think oh my god that was amazing and why didn't you know why can't I ever replicate that because I think there's a I think there's a lot of different elements to it <coughs> so I never saw the sweet play in their prime back in the day it was waiting for them to come on top of the pops and that was as close as it would get to mime to one of their own tunes with an audience clapping over the top of it introduced by some age you know now classified paedophile so really it wasn't, it wasn't a particularly good era for many reasons but and I look back on the suite now I mean they weren't pretty boys they looked like bricklayers in drag but they were like Queen they had three falsettos in the band and they had this massive vocal sound which I don't know why I just found it really really exciting and I loved the fact that they were a pop band they were a manufactured pop band, but they had another side to them. So Slade and Sweet, Susie Quattro, all of those Chin and Chapman acts had pop singles that Chin and Chapman wrote for them that were all high charting. But then they all were kind of like rock and roll bands on the other side of their album. So they'd quite often release an album that would be a pop side and a rock side. And it'd be like, oh, that's a... A different thing going on there or oh, sweet I had a whole double live album that I had with a five minute drum solo in it that was like all right that's very different they're pop singles but I kind of loved both and it taught me something about things aren't mutually exclusive it doesn't have to be just one thing or the other it can be both I think Slade were like that as well and quite a lot of the other bands T-Rex did loads of weird stuff Mark Bolan and Bowie and all those lot they had a kind of pop side and a weird thing I liked that so like when you've been talking about why you liked your favourite band so much like it's all been about the music was it ever about the people in the band <coughs> no I didn't know anything about the people in the band there was no access to it. It was about the outfits and the clothes. I mean, all the glam stuff. I mean, it looks ridiculous now when you look at it now. It had a very short shelf life, but they were like they'd landed off another planet. If you looked at Roxy Music or any, I mean, they looked amazing. Weird and amazing. <coughs> and I couldn't get clothes like that. I mean, you couldn't look like your favourite bands until punk happened. And then suddenly it was like, oh... Now I can look like my favourite bands. That's a whole different ball game. Now you could just go to the charity shop or cut things up or get some safety pins or beg your mum to take your flares in because you couldn't get straight leg jeans. They didn't exist. So clothing was really, really important. But right into, I don't know, say like 79, 80 you might not have necessarily even seen your favourite band play on the telly, let alone in real life, let alone know what they liked. You know, if you didn't, there used to be four music papers, there used to be NME Sounds, Record Mirror, NME Sounds, Melody Maker, Record Mirror, four music papers every week, all different. And as well as other things like Look In and Smash Hits and sort of more sort of teeny things which were all the posters that went on the wall, but you were looking at a poster of a photograph of somebody that you'd heard the song, but you didn't know anything about them, nothing. So it wasn't really till the punk thing happened that I started to take notice of who's playing that music, what do they think about life, do I think like that? Oh yeah, I think I probably do. And that changed it from then onwards, but then, by the time you got to the late 80s dance scene, I mean, who bloody cares what some housey DJ thinks about the price of sliced bread? I mean, it wasn't, it never, it didn't care anymore. Completely just came back round again. So, why do you think that now there's like this new breed of super fan who are, <coughs> you know, addicted to their 
phones and going to people's houses and staying outside them and why, why do you think that, that there's now this new I, well I don't think so, I don't think super fans are new I don't think it's a new thing I think that happened with Elvis it happened with the Beatles it happened with the Bay City Rollers it happened with Take That there's a long history as long as popular music has been around of people going bonkers to it I mean look at Elvis fans that was the 50s look at the Beatles fans that was you know 60s or the Stones so I think there's different types of super fans. I mean, I watched something last week where they said the classic question in the, in the 60s was Rolling Stones or the Beatles? That told you a lot about the person. Yeah, which one, yeah, oh yeah, I'm a Stones man myself. Oh, yeah. You know, which was a silly divide, but that came back round, didn't it, with Blur and Oasis. Are you Blur or Oasis? Why, why is that a competition? Which, you know, maybe you get it with you know one direction or five or whoever else is a competitor to them these days or you know July like Miley Cyrus or Katy Perry most I mean it, most of that stuff is fluff and nonsense created by the music industry to sell a story to sell the product and in actual fact the classic kind of instance of that was um, you know the Rage Against the Machine, sh the Rage Against the Machine song that does that "fuck you, I won't do what you tell me." There was a, a campaign to get that to go to number one instead of the X Factor mm -hmm. thing. Do you remember this? Yeah. It wasn't, so, it wasn't so long ago. And then the story that came out behind it is that they're on the same label. So who's going who's gonna to be the winner of that ridiculous competition, an X Factor artist or Rage Against the Machine, but they're on the same label. So somebody's sat back there going, well, that's, thank you very much. You know, so I think it's quite hard work to separate out the nonsense of the music industry, which is a lot of hype. It really is a lot of nonsense and hype from... I think the tricky thing is what you're looking at is a behaviour which is regarded as somehow not quite genuine. If if people go mental at an oasis, you know, I mean this is the classic rock pop divide. If people go mental at, um, I don't know, a Black Sabbath reunion gig or Oasis play again or who is it that's reforming this week? Stone Roses. Stone Roses are coming back to do a couple of gigs. Like, there's so many people that are going to go, oh my God, I never got to see them. Thank you so much. You know, to see that could make their lives if they were big fans. But that's regarded as a genuine, authentic experience of like, they're a special band, a legendary band. I mean, they might be a bit old and a bit ropey now, but it's still the Stone Roses, original members. Not like a lot of the bands now that are like one remaining original member and three stand-ins. But why is that regarded as a genuinely good, honest reaction to something that is regarded highly, whereas take that reform and look at the music press, there's nothing in. It's all in the tabloids or it's somewhere else. I mean, the music press are very snobby, I think, about pop. But I think it's, it's a high-low culture thing again, isn't it? You know, opera, classical music is good self-written songs by a respectable rock or folk artist good manufactured pop written by some mogul for some clothes horses who look good poncing around in outfits trivial throwaway not good not authentic but i really i really disagree with that as a binary thing i think bands like blondie for me were very and and the old bands that i was talking about like sweet were like no, you are both. You are a pop band and you're commercially successful and then you do this other stuff that's like, oh, right, I'm going to have to work a little bit harder at liking that. It's not so immediately accessible. I mean, pop's made to be accessible. It's made to be instant. It's made to make you whistle the tune when you walk down the street afterwards and not get it out of your head. That's an art form, but we've got a very snobby attitude towards it, I think.
questions. Did that totally go off the point of what you asked? No, no, it didn't. No. So let me just see if I've got anything else to say about. I mean, I, th I think um, there were bands that I followed, so like New Model Army, who were a sort of a great post punk band, had fans who would go and see them every day at the tour. And they were, a, you know, proper rock, it's hard to say it, proper rock band. It's very interesting, isn't it, how the words kind of come out. I don't mean it like that. They had a following who, like me, would hitchhike half the length of the country to get into a gig and, you know, da da da. But that was called a following, and that wasn't called obsessive or fanatical or like, well, why are you doing that? It wasn't a question. It was obvious why you did it. So... Mm, but then now, you know, you go to Bestival or Glastonbury and I can stand in a crowd and see The Cure with my 24-year-old daughter who's grown up being force-fed The Cure with an audience that ranges from 16 to 60, all singing along, knowing the tunes. I think that's kind of quite healthy, I quite like that. So it's a very different complexion now to a lot of the music scene. Old people like me haven't grown up in that way that maybe my parents didn't really, you know, they might have had a little bit of a flirtation with something in the 60s, but then they kind of grew up and became sensible adults. I don't think that'll ever happen again. So, I don't know, I think, I think what you're exploring through your fandom of a band and what the representations of that are probably going to open up quite a few cans of worms about the bigger picture and what else is going on around music. And that's not even getting into social networking, file sharing, the value of a product, how anybody makes any money out of making music anymore. All that stuff is right up for grabs. So there's something about um, influence as well, which I think is significant to me. So like the Sex Pistols in their day, hardly anybody saw them, they hardly played any gigs, they only made one album, they only had 13 songs and are commonly regarded as one of the most influential bands of all time. So there's something about that, about a movement being created or a thing being created that is a bit more than the sum of its parts. You're going to nod off, aren't you? <laughs> Stay with it, Beth. <laughs> like, does that happen with pop? That you get a thing that's created like punk or... I don't know. I don't really... Maybe, maybe I've missed out on that like Beatlemania was a thing wasn't it or roller mania was a thing there is something really incredible about being in the middle of something that everybody else there gets it I guess you could say that with you know take that or Robbie or lots of things where you see a stadium and everybody's just going along with the thing on the euphoria of the moment I think it's a really beautiful thing to experience but what, why is it framed as a negative thing I think that's part of your dissertation is to question why pop f pop super fans are framed as a negative thing whereas rock I, mean, I have no idea how this relates to classical music or other forms of music but a rock fan wouldn't be framed in the same way why is that is that like Who's, who gets to decide what's okay and what's not? Is it music press? Is it music industry? Is it Simon Cowell? I mean, I mean, I hate all that X Factor stuff. I really hate it. I mean, have you seen Dave Grohl's rant about the X Factor? It's a great Dave Grohl quote saying, you know, we were shit. We were practicing in somebody's garage with our mums coming in going, seriously lads, you're rubbish, stop it. And it was Nirvana. 
and they had that experience of kind of just doing it because they wanted to do it in a garage with their mum coming in saying can you stop playing you are terrible being rubbish knowing they were rubbish and kind of doing something with it somebody turns up for Simon, one of Simon Cowell's hench people to say to them you can't sing forget it how has that become a filter it's not healthy it's not useful I don't think But what I want you to think about is, as your, as the light of your fandom has dwindled slightly from being a super fan who knows where people keep their tea bags, <laughs> to say it again on camera, like where does that get parked in you as an adult as you grow grow up and become a sensible person? What do you do? It's like being a kid. You know, when you're a kid you get taught to play all the time let's go out to the park let's go for a walk play nicely play with each other play 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 and then somewhere along the line that just stops and you're meant to do all this kind of school and get a job and da, da, da. i mean i think being a fan and going to a gig is a real grown-up way of playing it's lovely why, why would we want to stop doing that that'll do for now that was a nice end note <laughs>